Hello and welcome to our Sunday service for St Peter's Anglican Church, Nightcliffe, uh, this Sunday the 4th of July. Earlier in the week we made the decision not to meet face to face because we weren't sure whether we would be allowed to or not. Uh, thankfully we are, but we are sticking with this decision to make life easier rather than trying to scramble in the last few days to work out how to do that. It's been an interesting week for all of us, hasn't it? Uh, many things have changed. Our plans have been upset, whether it's been uh, regular work has changed, whether it's been school holiday plans have changed, whether it's been travel, uh, either us leaving Darwin or other friends who we were hoping to come see uh, couldn't make it. But as always, we know that God is sovereign. He's in charge of all things, and though we aren't even able to meet together uh, because we're not meeting together this morning, uh, one of the things we are going to do, though, is still the same. We're going to hear God speak to us as we hear the Bible read and preached. We're going to respond with our trust and faith in him uh, through our prayers together and encourage each other as we live our lives together, hearing about different family news and then what life will look like in the week ahead at St Peter's. We've got a special guest preacher for us this morning, Simon Coford, who's moved to the Territory uh, and working in the Diocesan Office, and we'll get to meet him soon. But as the week has changed... As so many plans have been up in the air, uh, as things have impacted each of us individually, I suspect there have been times when we've wished things were different for us. We've wished they were changed. Uh, and sometimes there, we have acted in ways that have become particularly selfish. As much as uh, living in lockdown and living in stay-at-home orders is all about doing what is good, not just for ourselves, but for our community and our neighbour, uh, we know that we don't always do this. Let me remind you of the words from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus said, This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. As we reflected on the week, and the ways in which we maybe have or have not loved our neighbours as ourselves, We have or have not loved God with our whole heart, soul, mind and strength. Let's start our time together by confessing our sins to God. The words will appear on the screen. Will you please pray with me? Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared in Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant, most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live godly, righteous and sober lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Let me remind you of these reassuring words from Psalm 130. The psalmist says, If you, Lord, kept the record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. It's great to know that because Jesus died on the cross for us, we can be forgiven. Our sins are not just forgiven but forgotten. There is no record anymore. And so we can stand before God clean pure and righteous. Now what we're going to do from now on is hear the Bible read. Uh, Simon will preach for us and then I'll uh, lead some prayers together at the end. So let's hear from God's word. Hi everyone, I'm Laura and today's sermon reading is from the book of Mark. We'll be reading from Mark chapter 10 verses 32 to 45. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. 
Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, for the last few years at church, we have been reading through a kid's Bible each week. And in that time, we've read through three kid's Bibles. The one we've just finished is the Rhyme Bible, and it had lots of really good things about it. It was fun to listen to because it rhymed, it was good for really little kids, and it often got the gist of the story's right. But sometimes it left a little bit to be desired. Well, we're starting a new kids' Bible this week. We're going to start reading from the Lion Picture Bible. And this is sort of on the other end of the spectrum from the Rhyme Bible, because the stories you'll notice are a bit longer than what we're used to. Um, I'm really excited for us to be exposed to different kids' Bibles because different Bibles will suit different children in our lives. Uh, and also, obviously, they'll suit our children at different times as they grow and change. And the last thing that's worth saying is that this Bible reading isn't just for kids. It's a reading from a kid's Bible, but we hope that it will actually be helpful to everybody as we're reminded of these big stories that the Bible tells that all fit together. All right, so our first reading from the Lion Picture Bible, it probably won't surprise you, is from the book of Genesis, chapter one, and the title of it is In the Beginning. So here we go. Long before time began, there was no earth, just swirling watery darkness with nothing in it. But God was there. God spoke. Let there be light. Dazzling light appeared for the first time, chasing away the darkness. This is the first day ever, said God. The darkness came back for a while and God called it night. But next morning the light returned, as it always would. On the second day, God said, let there be sky. The sky unrolled, stretching out and spreading blankets of soft cloud. This is a good thing, God said. Now I will separate the dry land from the sea. Volcanoes erupted and mountains folded into shape. There was plenty of land, but nothing lived on it. A vast ocean filled the rest of the planet, sparkling in the fresh new light, but nothing lived in it. The water was empty and quiet. Another night came and went. When dawn broke, God said, I'm going to make plants, but they need sunshine to grow. The sun exploded into life and warmed the earth. Lush grass sprang up and trees that were heavy with fruit and seeds. Out in space, God made the moon and stars to light the sky so that it was never completely dark, even at night. God saw that the world was wonderful, but it was not finished yet. God filled the seas with every kind of swimming, darting creature. God sent soaring, fluttering birds to throng the sky. They sang and squawked, trilling their music across the earth. Animals, wild and tame, galloped and leapt, wriggled and slept on the beautiful earth God had made for them. Now 
God saw that the world was amazing, but still there was something missing. So God made the first people, a man called Adam and a woman called Eve. You will be my special friends, said God. This earth I have made provides all that you need. You must take care of it. God had finished his work. It was time to rest. The world and everything in it is very good, said God. It's very good indeed. Well, let's pray and thank God for the beautiful world that he made. Dear God, thank you that you made our world so beautiful and you made people to live in it and to be your special friends. We know that your world is broken now because of sin, but we also know that it won't always be. And we thank you that you made a way to fix that big problem. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, hello, St. Peter's uh, Nightcliff Church, uh, Anglican Church. My name's Simon Coford. I usually attend the 4.30 uh, service and um, I attend the uh, Thursday night Bible study. Uh, as you can see, uh, my first sermon at St. Peter's is uh, being pre-recorded in my lounge room, um, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, Joshua sent me some questions. I know uh, some of you at the uh, morning services won't uh, know me very well or may not have met me at all. And uh, Josh, as he likes to do, uh, uh, has sent me some interview questions. So uh, he asks, who is in your family? Well, my wife, Claire, and myself, and we have three sons, Luke, who's 17, Toby, who's 15, and Ben, who's just turned 12. Uh, and then Josh asks, what are you doing in Darwin? Um, well, uh, we've come to Darwin. Uh, my wife's uh, trained as a teacher and she specializes in literacy. Um, uh, and uh, she's working for the Catholic education, the Catholic education here, uh, d department here in Darwin. Uh, she's doing literacy both in urban settings, but also in remote settings. Um, I'm uh, working for the diocese. Uh, I was uh, previously a, a rector, vicar of a church in Melbourne for, um, uh, well, overall uh, about 17 years of pastoral ministry. Uh, and now I'm working for the diocese, helping out where I can, um, particularly at the moment in uh, the safe ministry, um, uh, all aspects of safe ministry. Um, how does Darwin lockdown compare to Melbourne? Well, shorter, because I think I've, we've just heard, as I, I'm pre-recording this on uh, Friday, we've just heard that perhaps uh, we'll be able to be out of lockdown by the end of today. So uh, somewhat shorter, uh, you know, we're, we're a bit surprised to be in this situation, but of course, nothing like uh, the six months that we, uh, that we endured uh, in Melbourne. Uh, we do lockdown pretty well. In fact, uh, working from uh, home outside in the sunshine is much better than a Melbourne winter. And how can you pray for us? Well, uh, yes, please keep praying for us. We've, uh, we're we're short-term workers with CMS. That's part of what's brought us here. We really want to um, help out uh, in the church and look for gospel opportunities. Uh, and uh, if you could pray for our family uh, in regards to that, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, let me pray for us. Uh, uh, you've already heard a Bible reading from uh, Laura. Let me pray for us as we uh, have a look at this text from Mark chapter 10. Almighty God, uh, we give you thanks and praise for your love and goodness to us. We pray that you'll give us uh, wisdom as we uh, meditate upon these words together. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us and give us courage uh, as we seek to live uh, obediently as your followers. Well, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, I remember when I was uh, a young teenager uh, getting my first pair of glasses and um, I didn't like them much. I wasn't even sure that they did very much. Uh, I sort of didn't think I really needed glasses and I didn't like to wear them anyway. Uh, until one night I was uh, on an astronomy trip for school and uh, we went out, I had my glasses with me and I tended not to wear them and then for some reason, I put them on uh, with the blazing uh, Milky Way before me and all of a sudden it just uh, jumped out at me. I couldn't believe the difference. Um, it was hard for me to see uh, that I couldn't see that well without my glasses. Um, 
Uh, another uh, a story about not understanding or not perceiving um, is uh, we, uh, like many of you, will have uh, been to uh, the summer schools, uh, CMS summer schools. I remember one time going uh, to summer school and we had a long drive there, a couple of hours drive to Phillip Island where summer school was at that time. Uh, we we got, got out of the car and um, went down to where the swimming pool was. The kids were having a fantastic time racing around. Uh, and one of our children, those of you at 4.30 that know our children can guess which one, uh, got so excited about the pool uh, as, four year, as a four-year-old, raced and raced around, saw all the kids racing around, and then dived directly in, fully clothed into the pool. Uh, not realising, not understanding, not perceiving that he wasn't able to swim yet. And so that was a bit dramatic and we had to pull him out of that. Well, the disciples, they don't understand that they don't understand. Um, in chapter 10 of the Gospel of Mark, open, open it in your Bibles at home, uh, Jesus is leading them up to Jerusalem. Uh, and verse 32 says this, uh, They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Uh, Jesus is striding off up towards Jerusalem. He is resolute, resolutely uh, heading off on his mission. He's heading uh, to his mission. And, and of course, we know what that means. Uh, he is heading to the cross. He's heading to the cross to die for sinners. But the disciples at this point, they don't understand. And even if they thought they understood, they don't really uh, understand. They are amazed. Uh, they are amazed at the power and authority of Jesus. They are astonished by uh, their ragtag team uh, heading up to Jerusalem, marching on Jerusalem. Uh, they don't feel like they feel prepared to take on the superpower, Rome, but they have seen Jesus do some pretty amazing things. They've seen Jesus do some amazing stuff. Uh, they are amazed. They are somewhat afraid um, that they are following him into the fray. But, you know, they're not amazed about what Jesus, uh, what awaits Jesus at Jerusalem. Uh, they're not amazed at, at what he's about to achieve there. They are, uh, they're not amazed, uh, they're not astounded by what's about to happen because they uh, don't understand. Like a young boy diving into the pool, not understanding that he can't swim. Or like myself, uh, putting those glasses on, not realising, very hard to see. Uh, it was very hard for me to see and understand and perceive that I couldn't see clearly. Well, the disciples are not amazed that Jesus is about to defeat an enemy far greater than the Roman Empire because they don't understand. They don't perceive. They don't see. They're not am amazed and afraid that Jesus is about to defeat death itself. They're not amazed uh, that Jesus is about to defeat the real enemy of the human race by overcoming humanity's sins and sin, dying for them on the cross. They're not amazed and astounded by these things because they don't understand them. They're not amazed and afraid that Jesus is not just their saviour, but the sa and, not, and not just the saviour of the Jews, uh, and not just the Messiah in that sense. Um, they're not amazed and surprised and astounded that Jesus is the saviour of every human of all time who puts his or her trust in him. They are not afraid and amazed and astounded because, uh, of, of, at all of this because they don't understand, they don't see, they don't perceive. And so in verse 32, uh, we read that again, he takes the 12 aside and he tells them that, that what was going to happen to him um, he tells them again, uh, we're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Uh, now, at this point in the story, perhaps you are even getting sick of Jesus repeating himself again and again and again. The cross, the cross, the cross. 
Um, our preachers uh, at St. Peter's seem to be preaching to the converted, you might say. They're preaching it again. The cross, the cross, the cross. It's almost like at, at uh, preaching school, they teach us nothing else but to preach the cross. Um, but this is why our preachers, uh, week in and week out, are preaching the cross as we preach through the Gospel of Mark. Oh, as we preach through just about any part of the Bible. The reason why the cross is central and repeated in our preaching is because the Bible repeats the cross. And I think the reason, uh, there's several reasons why I think the Bible, particularly the Gospel writer of Mark, is uh, laboring this point about the cross. Uh, the first is because the cross is absolutely central uh, and essential to faith in Jesus. Uh, secondly, because this is what really happened. The disciples really didn't understand it. And Jesus really did have to take them aside again and again. Uh, the third reason why the Bible goes on and on about the cross, particularly uh, the reason why God, the Gospel of Mark does, is because it was written to a persecuted church, uh, probably the Jewish Christians in Rome, under extreme persecution. Uh, it would have been easy for their faith to waver. But the writer of Mark directs them repetitively uh, to the cross and to the resurrection. He preaches to the converted again and again and again. Uh, he preaches the cross of Christ, offering the hope of salvation in death, offering the hope of eternal life to these people that are under great pressure. And I think there's a fourth reason why the New Testament goes on and on about the cross. It's for us, um, to 2,000 years on. Uh, there has been more words, they say, written about the Christian faith than any other topic in history. There's uh, reportedly 38,000 denominations. Uh, there is millions of churches. There's billions of Christians. Um, it would be very easy with all of that noise to get distracted from the central truth of our faith. So Mark repeats it for us. Well, we live in a completely different society to the one that Jesus was in. People have walked on the moon. There are people in, I think, two space stations right now circling the earth. Uh, with all of this technology, it would be very easy to get distracted from the central truth of the faith. So Mark repeats it. Uh, we are bombarded, aren't we, with information, with wealth, with toys, with entertainment, with everything that uh, at the tip of our fingers. Um, it would be very, very easy to get distracted from the central truth of our faith. So the Bible labors the cross. The Gospel of Mark labors the cross. And so your preachers, because we preach uh, systematically through the scriptures, labor the cross, particularly as we're preaching uh, through the Gospel of Mark. Now, uh, this uh, sermon was originally meant to be in school holidays and uh, no kids program. So I thought I would uh, try and uh, work with Laura to create something uh, uh, that is a bit interactive and uh, so that I wouldn't be just a talking head for too long. Uh, and so hopefully some of you have had the chance to download this, um, uh, this cross. Uh, and what it is, it's, a, it's an exercise uh, in which you can... Uh, Either follow the instructions, that's the easy way, or if you think you're really clever, you can do it without the instructions. Uh, and that is, uh, the challenge is to create a cross out of that piece of paper with just one cut. So you can only use one straight cut with a pair of scissors in, in order to create um, a cross. Let's see if I can do it for you. This might be a little bit rough. I'm sure you'll do a much neater job. Uh, so I folded my cross up. I have a pair of scissors here. One straight cut. And I've dropped it. And there you have it. The cross of Jesus. Uh, it speaks about Jesus the ransom and has that verse uh, from the last part of our passage there. I'm going to encourage you to have a go. You should be able to have downloaded uh, those pieces of paper and even the, even the instructions. Um, so uh, 
I think I'll either have a pause or we might be able to put some music into this video so that you guys can have a go at creating your own cross. Uh, and that's exactly right. I'm laboring the point, the centrality of the cross, particularly uh, for this sermon today. And uh, you can just hit pause on your YouTube and um, complete that cross. Um, and uh, we'll come back with the second half of the sermon in just a minute. Uh, so we continue on in uh, Mark chapter 10 from verse 35. Uh, this uh, section of the story is referring to James, of, uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, uh, and they're asking about um, uh, uh, places of privilege that they might be able to have with Jesus and in his kingdom. Let me read those verses uh, to you from verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, it's not exactly clear what James and John are asking for, not at least in the details. Uh, it could be um, seats of power when they take uh, Jerusalem by for force. It could be um, uh, seats at the uh, messianic feast, maybe. Uh, it could be a bit e eschatological. Uh, it might be seats of honour at Judgment Day. Uh, it could be any of these things, but what it, whichever it is, uh, it highlights that the disciples are still thinking in terms of human authority and honour. Uh, not in terms of servanthood and slavery. Um, Jesus then continues, You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink from the cup and uh, I drink from? I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. Uh, the cup is an Old Testament reference to God's wrath. Uh, you could read more about that in Isaiah 52. Uh, and also um, there's a lot about cups in Revelation if you wanted to go forward and read about the cup of God's wrath in there. So the cup is a cup of wrath, potentially. The baptism, of course, is an immersion. Uh, it may, in fact, be... Uh, immersion in fire. Uh, these two bold disciples go on. Uh, we can, we can um, be baptized and immersed in those things, uh, they answered. And then Jesus said to them, you will drink of the cup I, I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Now, James and John will learn the hard way that their discipleship and commitment to Jesus and the, and the good news about Jesus, the gospel, uh, will cost them their lives. Uh, James uh, the, was the first apostle to die uh, as a martyr, um, proclaiming the good news about Jesus. You can read more about that in Acts chapter 12. Uh, and tradition has it that John died a very, very old man, um, but had given, given his life uh, for the gospel in any case. Um, and uh, as, as we read that, uh, as we read the book of Revelation attributed to John, the Apostle John, and as tradition states, he lived uh, until uh, a very old age. Uh, the ten here are worried about human jostling and for position. Uh, uh, they're highlighting that they are thinking in terms of human authority and honour. Uh, so in verse 2, 
uh, uh, verse 42, sorry, uh, Jesus calls them together again uh, and says, um, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, Jesus is saying, take my example. When you're looking uh, for uh, places to serve, uh, take my example. Uh, I am the greatest among you, says Jesus, but I have become your slave. Uh, In fact, he becomes the ransom. He is that... uh, Passover lamb, that sacrifice, dying that we might live. He gives his life. He pays the ransom, not just, uh, he does, not just the ransom uh, on the credit card. He just doesn't pay a small price. He pays the ultimate price, his own life, as a ransom for us all. Um, he gives his life. He takes upon himself... Uh, our own sin. You have probably seen this illustration before. Um, if this was, if this book was a, a book of uh, Simon's sins, uh, it, it's actually not big enough. It would be a bigger book than this. Uh, and if this is me, and God is somewhere up there, my sins is the block. It's stopping me from getting to my father in heaven. Uh, Jesus, the sinless one, uh, is here. Nothing blocking him, uh, his relationship with his father in heaven. He takes his, the sins upon himself. He is the ransom. He takes upon himself my sins so that I might have a relationship with my father in heaven. Uh, this is the idea of ransom. Now, you might think, did Jesus stay like this? Was he forever banished, uh, forsaken by God? Well, no. Um, Through the power of God, he is resurrected. He defeats sin. He defeats death and is reconciled with his father. He gives his, his life as a ransom for many. He's resurrected to eternal life. The first fruits are to eternal existence with God our Father. Uh, James and John die as servants preaching this good news about Jesus so that they um, so that people might be rescued and redeemed. Uh, Except for Judas, the rest of the twelve as far as we know uh, do exactly the same. The twelve disciples uh, eventually do understand, they eventually do get it, they eventually do see Uh, all throughout the gospel, they don't understand. And Jesus has to take them aside again and again. But eventually the 12 do get it. They eventually uh, do understand. It's hard to imagine how they will get there, isn't it? It's hard to imagine how they can possibly get there. Uh, Next week's passage might give us a hint. Have you got people that you know and you wonder how are they ever going to get there? Uh, Next week's passage... Um, Jesus asked blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus responds, Rabbi, I want to see. Sight is given through faithful asking and through uh, a gracious miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. Almighty God, uh, we thank you uh, for your cross Uh, We thank you, Lord, for your death in our place, that we might have a clear relationship with our Father in heaven. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us uh, not to be distracted by the many things in this world, and that you'll help us to keep the cross of Christ central in our lives. We also pray, Lord, that you'll help us to have servant hearts, uh, to understand that your kingdom is not a kingdom of human triumph, but of power in weakness. And we pray, Lord, that you will uh, encourage us 
in our testimony, in our faith, in our witness to the good news about Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. I'm going to pray for the COVID situation in Australia and around the world. I'm going to give thanks uh, for the ministry of Simon Kofid, but also of our diocese and pray for our diocese and office, as well as the rest of this diocese. And we're going to give thanks uh, for Jesus coming, uh, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And lastly, I'm going to pray a collect uh, for the coming of the light. The coming of the light uh, is, was celebrated during the week as the 150th anniversary of the good news, the gospel uh, of Jesus coming to the Torres Strait Islands. And then we're going to conclude by saying the Lord's Prayer together. So would you please pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your kindness, uh, the territory lockdown has been short uh, only these last five days. We thank you for the many people who work so hard during this time, uh, contact tracing, calling people, getting tests and testing uh, various things. Uh, we do thank you for the politicians and all in the health department who've had to make uh, tough decisions, extending a lockdown initially, calling for a lockdown in Alice Springs. Uh, we do thank you for so much work and effort that's been poured into these last five days. And we thank you for many in the community who have abided by these lockdown restrictions so that in your kindness this disease has not spread and our lockdown was lifted on Friday. Our Father, we ask that in your kindness you will keep the territory safe from COVID, preferably COVID-free. And we pray this particularly for the sake of those who are vulnerable health-wise in our community and the realisation that if it did break out in a severe way, we are so under-resourced for it. We pray now and commit to you other parts of our country that are still impacted by COVID, whether it's Sydney, Brisbane, Perth or Adelaide. We ask that you'll be with all those who are living there in various states of restrictions, uh, that you'll help people abide by these for the good of the community. We also want to commit to you the vaccination rollout. Uh, we thank you for those who are making hard decisions and encouraging this to happen. Uh, we recognise that there are many uh, differing opinions about many different aspects of this. But we do ask that in your kindness you'll provide all the supplies that are necessary so that more and more people can be vaccinated uh, for the sake of all. Heavenly Father, we thank you also for Simon and his family that are here in Darwin and their ministry not just at St Peter's in Simon's preaching today, uh, but also uh, through their life and Simon's ministry in the diocese and office. Well, we pray that you'll be with him as he continues to get to know what life looks like in ministry here in the Northern Territory and in our diocese. We pray that he'll have opportunities to keep meeting the people that he needs to, uh, to be able to support them well in his role as Assistant uh, Ministry Development Officer. We also pray for the broader diocese. We thank you for those who are serving you in other churches, in local communities and remote communities. We ask you as the Lord of the harvest that you will raise up more workers for your harvest here in the Territory. We pray in particular that you will be with the parishes of Catherine and Fred's Pass as they are looking for new rectors. We ask that you will be working now in the hearts and minds of those you want to come and serve in these roles. We ask again that you'll continue to be with us as we look for another assistant minister to join us here at St Peter's. And we pray that you will encourage us all to keep being able to proclaim the good news of Jesus with our friends, family, neighbours, colleagues and teammates around Darwin and the Territory. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll strengthen Greg, our Bishop. Please give him wisdom and energy as he makes good decisions for the sake of the whole. Help him as he supports and cares for clergy and church workers around the Territory and as he has the hard job of recruiting people to come. We pray that you'll bless his marriage to Annette and strengthen them to support each other in their lives here in Darwin. <coughs> 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus into this world uh, in order to serve us. We thank you that he came not to be served but to serve and that that service included giving his life as a ransom for us to pay the price that we cannot pay. And we thank you for the great news that it is that Jesus is your son who paid that price for us. We pray that this will be good news that brings light and life to many around uh, Darwin, the Territory, Australia and the world. And we ask that this news will continue to spread uh, and help many people come from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your light, the light of your sun. And this week as we celebrate the coming of the light to the Torres Strait Islands, we want to pray this together. Almighty God, you have given to the people of the islands of the Torres Strait the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. Mercifully grant that we may always walk in the light of his love and give us the strength and unifying power of your Holy Spirit to spread that light and enlarge your kingdom in the hearts of all people. And let's finish by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And just before we finish our, our service, I know it's been kind of short and, and swift and kind of package down. I just want to let you know a few items of family use. The first one is that uh, my family uh, will be heading off on holidays this week. Uh, we're still unsure as to exactly what that will look like, uh, but we're anticipating uh, not uh, being away uh, and possibly even away from Darwin over the next two Sundays, but we'll see you on our return. Uh, next week, God willing, we will be able to do church back as usual, but can I ask you to do two things? Can you come with a mask if we still need to wear masks when we meet together in public? And can I also encourage you to please download the Territory Check-in app if you haven't already uh, so that we can all use the QR code to check in when we arrive. And so come a little bit early to make sure we can do this uh, smoothly and uh, swiftly when you come next Sunday. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, whether you've been by yourself, whether you've been with those in your household, or whether you have had some guests in your household, up to 10, uh, it's been great for us to be able to hear God speak to us through his word uh, and to respond in repentance and faith. See you when I see you next. Bye-bye.